you have all you know, this notification. Uh, anyway, this is a great lecture. First of all, I will give a word to my project coordinator, Professor Natasha Djuricic Mladenovic. So please give us a few words on the project and on the aim of this lecture. Thank you. Thank you uh, and uh, good afternoon to you. Maybe one microphone is still on. With oh, problem. So I'm very pleased that we gather today and uh, on this occasion, especially knowing that this occasion itself represents possibility and opportunity to attend the Professor Joao Crespo lecture. Uh, this is organized within the um, Twin Soul Sets project, coordinated by the Faculty of Technology in Novi Sad. Uh, the, uh, the project itself deals with, um, if I may say, very hot topics of the occurrence of contaminants of emerging concern in the environment, and especially the advanced analytics and technologies for their removal. Professor uh, Crespo and his team from uh, Nova University of Lisbon are part of our consortia, consortium uh, that also includes uh, the partner from Barcelona, Institute for uh, Water Research and Environmental Assessment, uh, with the uh, knowledge and experience in the field of membrane technologies teams from the Nova University in Lisboa, uh, significantly contributes to the research part of our project, but we also have another kind of activities and the activities for the boosting of the research administration and management of our faculty, uh, which is the part of activities that is uh, uh, significantly we have contribution of, of our team from Lisboa. I'm very grateful to the professor for designing a series uh, of lectures on membrane processes within, uh, within our project. And this series starts today uh, with his lecture, and I eagerly support, and suppose that all of us eagerly wait for this lecture. So, Nicola, please proceed with the, our program. Thank you. Thank you, Natasha. Thank you for the nice words. Now I will give uh, words to my professor Zita Shers, who will give us a few in information regarding the. Uh, Professor's expertise in this field of interest. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, hello. Uh, Mike. <laughs> uh, do you hear me? Uh, hello. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, we are really honored to have uh, Professor Crespo in our team, and we are very eager to learn from him every time we learn something new from him. Uh, I would like to introduce him, but I think everybody knows him in, who's dealing with membrane and chemical engineering. But anyway, I would like to say that Professor Crespo is a full professor of chemical engineering at Nova School of Science and Technology at Nova University. Uh, previously, he was a vice rector of research and innovation at Nova University. Uh, now, Professor Crespo is a a dean of ITQB, what means uh, Institute of Technology, Chemistry, Biology, which is a scientific research institute of uh, Nova University. Uh, he also coordinates a PhD program in bioengineering at MIT Portugal uh, with uh, correspondence uh, with Massachusetts Institute of Technology and was the leader of 21 research pro uh, projects funded by the European Commission. Uh, he is very dedicated to membrane science, membrane separation processes, and co uh, which confirms that he is an honorary member of uh, European Membrane Society as well. Also, he is a creator and organizer of well-known international scientific conference Imagine Membrane, a beautiful title. And uh, just to note that the next conference will be in spring 2025. Uh, am I right? 
Yes. Uh, okay. And uh, due to his uh, interesting lectures and extensive knowledge of membranes, he gives lectures all over, the, over the world about membranes. And recently, he was the primary lecturer on ICOM conference. It's an international congress on uh, membranes and membrane processes, which was uh, this year held in Japan. And it's worth to mention that uh, the honorary issue of scientific journal membranes was also dedicated to Professor Crespo. Uh, in addition uh, to all of his great achievements, I have to say this he, he's a very kind man, uh, a good friend, and who helps everyone a lot and transfer his knowledge to everyone who is interested. So thank you, Professor. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Thank you, Professor Zita. Now, uh, last but not the least, I will give a word to the top star of this lecture. It's Professor Joao. And now, please uh, help us to understand principles of pressure-driven membrane pr processes in your in your 45-minute lecture. Thank you, Professor. Thank you so much, uh, Nicola. And well. First place, let me uh, acknowledge the, the very kind words you have for me. Uh, um, more kind than I deserve for sure, but uh, thank you so much. It has been a pleasure to be with you in this in this project. And um, <clears throat> I think that we have lots of interesting things to do together. Well, things that we started already. So these, uh, these series of, of lectures that we agreed to uh, among us to, to start, and I'm the, the first one to, to start. I decided to, to suggest a very simple start. It's simple, but sometimes the most simple things are the ones that are very important to settle in a very clear way. So what I thought to do was to do a, a simple lecture on <clears throat> the principles of pressure-driven membrane processes. I believe that many of you that are familiar with membranes will find that the things that I'm going to discuss are very basic. But as I said, sometimes I think it's on the basic things that the ideas have to be clear. So I take this chance more as an opportunity to share some information with you and also to um, to start talking and discussing about among, among us about a few ideas. So I should say one thing, which is today I'm not going to show any research results. So I'm just going to discuss a few principles. So this is not the typical lectures that I'm more used to do. Uh, but this is a chance for us to have a discussion at the end. Let's put it this way. Okay. So, saying this, <clears throat> starting with the most uh, basic things, which is a possible definition of a membrane. And, and the most simple definition that I know about the membrane is that the membrane is a selective barrier between two different phases. Actually, is the fact that the membrane has a perm selectivity, that has a selectivity in terms of the species that may permeate that allows us to create two different environments. And this is very interesting because, for instance, when you have a particle, the, the, the environment around the particle is always the same. When you have a membrane, due to the fact that the membrane allows permeation of different species to occur in a different way, you are able to create two different environments on the two sides. And creating different environments on the two sides of the membrane is a way for us to start organizing the physical space. And if you explore this idea, you can do many, many interesting things. Now, today I'm going to talk about pressure driven, so I'm going to exclude many, many different things. But in terms of general language, and you know that the membrane itself can be made of many different materials, can have many different morphologies and, and structures. That can, they can be porous, but they can also be dense, non-porous. And you can apply different driving forces across. So I'm not going to expend too much time here. I'm just going to say that today we will look to the situation where we apply uh, a pressure difference, a delta P, as the driving force. And of course, if you have a mixture of different species on the fit side, that means that the membrane, if it has some perm selectivity, will allow some species to go out uh, to pass. Uh, in a more easy way and others to be retained or pass in a more indirect way. Okay, so that introduces selectivity and that's why your permeate will be different from your feet. And that's why you start creating different physical spaces on the two sides of the membrane. 
Okay, this is the, the most simple way to approach it. Now, <clears throat> to fulfill the kind of rules that you can have with a membrane, we, we can start thinking on designing different kinds of materials and materials, membranes with different structures and different morphologies. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time here because today we are going only to talk about processes where you apply um, a difference in pressures, a driving force. So probably today I'm going to focus on very simple um, or a limited number of possible structures. Uh, initially, the most simple membranes are what membranes that are called isotropic micro microporous membranes. Isotropic, why? Because I'm assuming that all along the, the thickness of the membrane, you have the same kind of morphology, the same kind of pore structure. So these membranes, um, if you have to assure a certain thickness of the membrane to assure mechanical stability, these membranes, if you want to apply them, for instance, for um, water filtration or so, in principle, they are not the best choice. And they are not why. Because for, imagine that you want to retain small chemical species. In that case, your pores have to be narrow. Now, if your pores are narrow, and if your membrane is relatively thick, because you want to have mechanical stability, mechanical strength, then your permeability will be very low. See, very tight pores, long um, permeation path length, your, your fluxes will be low. Uh, and so typically you don't use these when you have to process liquids. It's not a good choice. You use them if you want to do air filtration. That's fantastic. But then the, uh, the density and the viscosity of... Uh, of gases is much lower. If you want to process liquids, actually there was a, a fantastic breakthrough when Professor Love and Surirayan came up with the mesotropic membranes. I'm not going into the process of phase inversion that they developed to produce the mesotropic membranes. I'm just going to talk about the kind of morphology they were able to develop. And here in this case, typically what is possible to obtain is with the same material, imagine that you have a polymer, with the same material, you get a membrane where you have tighter pores in the top side and then an open structure in the bottom side. You can see that in the figure uh, on the bottom on the left. And what is the consequence of this? You have mechanical stability because you have the right thickness of the membrane. You have the selectivity that you want because you have narrow pores at the top surface. But as the structure opens, your resistance to transport and to flux is not as high as in isotropic membranes. What is the consequence of this? The consequence of this is that you can get the selectivity that you want, but at the same time, the fluxes that you require and the mechanical stability. And this was a revolution when these membranes were, were brought uh, and, and developed. It's a huge revolution in the, in the, in the market. <clears throat> now, these are what is called integral asymmetric membranes interior because they are made of the same material. What you can do later is, for instance, to uh, create a top layer of a certain material with, a, with for imagine, with narrow pores, but supporting in a structure with a larger port. And then you use more than one material. You have what is called as a composite membrane. And then we have a composite membrane where the top layer assures you the selectivity. But then you have an open um, you know, supporting layer that provides you mechanical stability. And at the same time, you can assure high selectivity by the top layer, mechanical resistance, and, and also um, the, the right kind of structure to allow you for high fluxes. Okay? So typically what you see now today in the market, if you want to process liquids using um, pressure-driven processes, you apply, you typically use either use anisotropic membranes, either because they are um, integral uh, anisotropic membranes, the same material, or use composite membranes where the top layer has narrow pores and the support has more open pores. That's, that's what you do now, nowadays, okay? Now, you know that you can play with different materials. I'm not going to explore that very much. You can you have polymeric materials, you can also have ceramic materials, but you can combine this kind of concept. Okay. And on ceramic materials, it's very common that you have composite membranes where the top layer is one material and supporting layer is a different material. Okay. 
Now, when I'm talking about pressure driven, I'm always, or in most cases, we are thinking of in terms of pores. And my lecture today is very much focused on, on pores memories. But you have to think that if you are talking about reverse osmosis, or even if you're talking about very tight polymeric nanofiltration memories, then the concept of pore doesn't make much sense because you are in the scale where you really don't have permanent pores. What you have is, for instance, polymers that have a free volume, which I can look to them as dynamic uh, voids or spaces that allow for convective transport across. Okay, so typically we don't talk about pores when you talk about reverse osmosis membranes. And in that case, we have still convective transport, but we cannot say that we have pores, they're not permanent pores. Okay, I'm talking too much because I'm only on slide three, I have to speed up. Just to show you a few structures, what you can see here on the left hand side, figure A, it's a typical symmetrical membrane, so you see the same kind or symmetrical or isotropic membrane, so the same kind of morphology from one side to the other. As I told you, for instance, for gas filtration, that makes lots of sense. <laughs> On the middle, you have what is called an integral asymmetric membrane, integral Y, because it's made of the same material. I don't have a pointer, but probably you can see on you can see a top layer, dense top, not dense, sorry, a tight porous top layer on the top. So you have very tight pores, you cannot see, almost see them. And there, an open structure that provides you mechanical strength, it at the same time it allows you to have a good permeation. On the right hand side, figure C, you can see two different materials. So I can have a top layer that can be tight pores, but could also be a dense material supported on, on a porous support. And this is what is called a composite membrane. So this offers a, lower, a large degree of freedom to select the materials according with the application that we have in, in mind. Okay? Now, <clears throat> sometimes we ask, okay, but filtration, we do filtration for many, many, many decades. Why to filter with membranes? Uh, why to do membrane filtration and why not just traditional filtration? <coughs> And actually, I'm a little bit, um, I took a figure that is not related with traditional filtration, but I can use it for that. And now it's a pity that I don't have a pointer to show you. But Okay, what happens is that if when you do traditional filtration, you, you use what is called like a, a material like a tissue, right? So if you have a tissue, the retention of molecules of, 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 or particles or so at, at, at the surface, doesn't really happen strictly at the surface because what you have the feed with the particles they go through and the particles that are there is a probability that the particle is retained by the fibers that make the uh, the tissue so actually is an in-depth retention of particles okay is not an absolute retention at the surface that as as a consequence that, that your rejection curve is a more diffused curve. It's the, the curve that I wrote here as a diffuse cutoff, as a more diffused curve. That means what? That our rejection curve is not a perfect step. The holy graal of a rejection curve should be a perfect step. I cannot show with the, with the mouse, but a perfect step means that below a certain size or below a certain molecular weight, I should have rejection zero. And above a certain molecular weight, I should have rejections 100% or one. That perfect membrane does not exist. But the steeper the rejection curve, the better your membrane is, because it tells you that you are rejecting below a certain mass or a certain size or and allow to sorry to, to permeate below a certain size and reject above a certain size. So a perfect membrane that is does not exist, but a sharp cutoff. A sharp sign, a sharp curve of rejection is what you are looking for. Now, if you compare traditional filtration with the membrane filtration, one of the points that is very relevant to that is that as traditional filtration is the retention, which is a probability to retain a particle inside the mesh of the tissue, your rejection curve is more diffuse. If you use the membrane with a more controlled pore size at the surface, of course, not all the pores have the same size, but you have a better control of the surface, then your rejection curve is more sharp and gives you what? Gives you a permeate with a higher quality. 
And this is why this is getting so much interesting, or this was one of the reasons why they start getting so interesting. Okay, moving on. Now, this is a slide that I'm going to fly over it because it's very known. And so this tries to relate the, the size of the compounds or particles that you want to retain with the characteristics of the memory that allows for that retention. So it's very common because you used to use, use a certain definition that above 0 0.1 microns, we talk about microfiltration and below 0 0.1 microns, we start talking about ultrafiltration. You know that microfiltration allows you already to retain any bacteria, uh, yeasts, um, protozoa, um, these kind of things. Uh, if you think on uh, Giardia, Cryptosporidium for water treatment, you can do them with microfiltration. Ultrafiltration, typically, we are talking below that, um, that pore size, and usually we don't use a language of pore sizes. We start talking about molecular weight cutoff. That means that we use the, um, the rejection curves that we may obtain to characterize the ultrafiltration memory. So if I say that I have ultrafiltration memory with a molecular weight cutoff of 100 kilodalton, that means that they have 95% of probability to retain all molecules with a molecular mass above 100 kilodaltons. That's what it means. So today, when we think in terms of pressure-driven processes, we are talking about what? Microfiltration. Then ultrafiltration comes down, let's say, to 2,000, 1,000 Dalton. Below that, uh, down to let's say 200 or 250 Dalton, we talk about nanofiltration. It's difficult to put the bars in the right place because the, the words are long. So nanofiltration should be more to the left, let's say. And <clears throat> below that, we talk about reverse osmosis. So reverse osmosis is something that you use a lot if you want to retain uh, all components. So it's very much used, of course, for seawater desalination. Nanofiltration is extremely interesting if you want to retain, for instance, multivalent or divalent ions, but you allow to somehow permeate most of monovalent ions. There is some rejection of monovalent, but not the full rejection. So I move on. Okay, so the basic equations everyone is familiar with is, is that imagine that I take a pure solvent because the um, Darcy's equation was developed for pure solvents, not, not for suspensions or for, um, or for um, solutions. It, this is, was developed for pure solvents. But if I plot the volumetric flux of a solvent against the transmembrane pressure that I applied, so the pressure difference between the two sides of the filter, I should get a straight line. And from this straight line, I can get <clears throat> what is called, if I am correct with the words, if I, I get what is called a, um, a permeance. Actually, people that work on liquids and on filtration with liquids tend to use the term permeance and permeability in a very free way, and they mix both. Nothing wrong with that. I mean, that's the culture in the community that works with membranes in liquids. But actually, the ratio between the flux and the driving force, the pressure difference, should be called permeance. Okay? The permeability takes into consideration the thickness of the membrane and is a characteristic of the material. But don't get very mad with me if I also talk in a very free way because it's very common that people would call this permeability instead of permeance. If you're working with gases, no one confuses permeance with permeability because people are very much interested to compare the different materials. And to compare materials, you compare permeabilities, not permeances. Okay, anyhow, what I can see here is that if you have a pure solvent, you should have a, a relation, a straight um, linear relationship between the flux and the driving force. Okay? And that's the premise that I have here. This premise is nothing else than the inverse of the viscosity of the solvent multiplied by the intrinsic resistance of the membrane. So if I know the viscosity of the solvent that, is, that I'm permeating and I can know it for a given temperature, I can calculate intrinsic resistance of the membrane. And this is something that you do when you receive a fresh membrane in your lab. If it is a polymeric membrane, first I do a compaction study. Let's say I, 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 I put it under some pressure. <clears throat> and then I, if I do a clean water flux, 
I plot the flex that I obtain against the transmembrane pressure that I apply. I determine the slope, so which is the permeance. And if I know the viscosity of the temperature of the measurement, I calculate the intrinsic resistance of the membrane. If I know that, I'm characterizing my membrane in terms of intrinsic resistance. And it's something that I should know, because if I keep on working with that membrane, that membrane may lose some performance and I may want to relate with the original characteristics of the membrane. Now, just a few words about osmotic pressure and why. The concept is something very simple and I think it's familiar to everyone. Um, when I talk with my students, I try to do it very carefully. But I think that for all of you, it's, it's, very, it's very obvious. But, so, but let's think on this. Imagine that you take two different compartments and imagine that you have what is called a perfect membrane. The perfect membrane will be a membrane that is completely permeable to water, but imagine that this membrane is absolutely non-permeable to ions, okay? to any kind of, uh, of ions, cations or anions. Imagine that you have the perfect membrane. Now imagine that you have two compartments with different ion concentration. I can say that the water activity is higher here than here, or the water concentration if you prefer, which means that if this membrane rejects all the ions but is fully permeable to water, that means that if I put this membrane here, naturally water will come into this direction to compensate for the gradient in water activity. So water will come into this direction and this side will go up. Okay. Now imagine that <clears throat> once this happens, I apply here a pressure. I have a piston, I apply a pressure. If the pressure that I apply uh, allows me to equilibrate the two compartments and so no water will go, the pressure that I'm applying is equal to the osmotic pressure difference between the two compartments. That's how I should define the osmotic pressure difference between the two sides. If the pressure that I apply on this side overcomes the osmotic pressure difference, I will make water moving in the opposite direction that water naturally would like to go. And so I'm moving water from lower water activity to higher water activity. And it's what, it's exactly what you do when you do uh, seawater desalination. We apply a, water, a pressure and an hydrostatic pressure above the osmotic pressure difference between the two compartments. Okay, and that's why I, what I wrote here, the flux, is your permeance multiplied by your driving force. The driving force is the hydraulic pressure difference that I apply above the difference in osmotic pressure, okay? So <clears throat> if uh, my osmotic pressure difference is high, as happens in uh, seawater, I have to apply a pressure that overcomes that. The osmotic pressure usually can be easily calculated with the Venthoff equation, which is a linear relation between the osmotic pressure and the molar concentration. Be careful, this is molar concentration, not mass concentration of all the solids that are present. I would love to discuss things that are here, but I think I don't have the time. Maybe then on the discussion period, we can talk about it, but we could discuss about what you do in seawater desalination, about recovery rate, pretreatment, then other things that are related with that. But I will move on. Now, what happens in this is known. <clears throat> if, uh, if you have a, um, if you process, not a pure solvent, but if you process a, um, a suspension or, or a solution, what happens is that typically you start not observing a linear relationship. Look here, I have pure water and I represented the volumetric flux against the driving force, which is the difference in, in pressure, okay, the transmembrane pressure. With water, I should get a linear relation. If I use a suspension or a solution with some kind of molecule, it's strict, it's very normal that in or low pressures, you may have some linear relation and that after a while, you have a level off of that, of that relation and you obtain what is many times called as a limiting flux. Now, where should you operate? Now, the mouse will be very helpful, but you should operate according with your operating costs and your aim. Because you see, if I operate with a pressure above what I'm calling now critical pressure, if I operate slightly above that, I can get a higher flux. 
And so if I have a high interest to operate at high fluxes, I may want to operate above the critical pressure. But if my problem is I want a very stable operation that lasts for a long time without the need to clean the membrane or so, then it could be very interesting to operate at a more gentle pressure below what is called critical pressure. Nowadays we use more language, language like sustainable pressure. We should operate at a, at a gentle pressure where the flux that that data get is lower than the limiting one. So I'm, I, I'm, I'm accepting to have a lower flux, but at least I have this relation that is linear, which is from the energetic point of view is good, and is linear, why? Because in principle here, your, I will explain the terms, polarization of concentration and falling will be lower. And if we operate here, you can operate for a long time without the need to clean your membrane. So in some operations that what we, your concern is to operate for a long, long, long time in a very stable way without stopping for cleaning, this is a very interesting option. Okay? That's something that we should keep in mind, but depends on what you want. Okay? The reason why this is happening is related with two phenomena, and I'm going to try to talk about both in a distinct way. Polarization of concentration is a term that many, one, many people in the, um, in the um, memory community uses. But actually, if you think as a chemical engineer in, the, in, in, uh, in, a, in a more broader sense, a polarization of concentration is something that is very much related with the fact that you are building up what is called a concentration boundary layer. Now, as I don't have the point that I use my hands, okay? Suppose that you are filtering something. With memory, you know that many times you filter in the tangential mode, in the cross-flow mode, and the reason is because by doing it in a cross-flow mode, you think that your chance to accumulate material at the surface is reduced. But okay, so let's imagine that I'm operating the cross-flow mode, but let's imagine that I apply pressure that is not that small. So that means that I'm pushing all the material towards the surface, okay? If I'm pushing all the material towards the surface, that means that I start having a higher concentration of solute at the surface. And why do I have that? The reason is very simple. Because the solvent goes very quickly through the pores, but the solutes know the solutes that I'm retaining. And so I build up a, a, a higher concentration of solute near the surface. That means that I have a concentration boundary layer near the surface. This happens with memories, but happens in most or any um, membrane process, or sorry, any uh, chemical engineering process, okay? At the interface, you have an accumulation of the solid that is transported at a slower rate. Now, think on something. Polarization concentration is a mass transfer phenomena, is the fact that the solvent goes fast, the solid goes slower and accumulates at the surface. Due to the fact that you are accumulating the, the, or you have a high concentration of solid near the surface, due to that, that solid starts absorbing to the surface or to interacting more with the surface of the memory and falling occurs. Falling is because you have either physical or chemical adsorption at the surface. It is a phenomenon that happens always that you have molecules in a, in a solvent that get into contact with the surface because the surface has a chemistry, the solid has a chemistry and they can establish interactions. So falling is a phenomenon that happens if you have a fluid phase with solids that faces a surface. Okay. The link between the two is if your mass transfer is poor, that means that if you allow the solid to concentrate near the surface, so if your mass transfer is poor, it means that your polarization of concentration is significant, then you favor falling phenomena. Why? Because the solid is concentrated, these interactions with the surface are more severe. So these are two different phenomena. They are interlinked because poor mass transfer leads easily to falling. But they are different things. One is a, is a mass transfer issue. The other is molecular interactions issue.
the consequence that you see from a microscopic point of view is the reduction of flux. And that's why you see this curve with this shape. Okay, but there are differences. Let me move on. Well, somehow I already explained what is here, because if I look to a, to a solid or to a particle that is close to a membrane, the particle is exposed or the solid is exposed to different kinds of forces. If I'm operating in a cross-flow mode, I have this tangential force. But if I'm filtering, there is a delta P, there is a driving force. So I have what is called viscous forces of attraction. And then depending on the materials and how I design my process, I may have electrostatic repulsive forces and I may have van der Waals attractive forces. Okay? That's why it's very important to select the charge of the surface of the membrane and create conditions for the charge of the solid that the interactions are repulsive. If I have repulsive interactions, the solid does not tend to come so much to the surface. But what this slide also tells us is that if we apply a large delta P, a large pressure difference, then the viscous forces are very high and I start pushing the material towards the surface and I accumulated it at the surface. So if I exaggerate on these viscous forces on the delta P, on the delta pressure, I, it's very simple that I start accumulating salt. And you may remember what I said, if I accumulate solid near the surface, falling is very easy to occur because at higher concentrations, the molecular interactions between the solid and the surface are more intense, more severe. Okay, so what should I do? I should control the forces that have an impact on the transport and I should play with the physical chemical properties of the membranes and the solids. I should play with the pH and ionic strength that promote repulsion. This is the kind of things that I should do as an operator. <laughs> okay. Now, I like always to say when I'm talking with my students, I always tell them fouling is not an exclusive of membranes. Actually, if we look to the chemical engineering literature, fouling started to be studied in heat exchangers. Why? Right? If you look to heat exchangers, it's very common that you start looking to the first studies on falling. Why? Because when you have a heat exchange, you have, for instance, water that may contain a number of chemical species, in many cases, um, ions and, and cations that can precipitate at the surface. So falling is a phenomenon that is not strictly associated with membranes. Because sometimes I have students that think that falling is a membrane, is strictly a membrane problem. It is not. Falling occurs when you have molecular interactions between the solids and the surface. And that may happen any time you have a solid on the surface. That may also happen if you have a particle. If you have solids that go through a, through a packed bed or so, you may have falling off the particles. Of course, if you have transport through a membrane, you may also have falling membrane. I'm not going to spend much time on describing the different kinds of falling, so I'm going to reduce this to a very simple thing. Talking about external falling when typically the interactions between the solids and the membrane are established at the outer surface of the membrane. But of course, you have situations where the chemical species can penetrate inside the pores and fall inside the pores. What can I tell you is that this internal falling is much more difficult to eliminate than if you have external falling, okay? Much more difficult. And if we want to do good engineering when designing this process, we should think on the process of filtering, but then we should think on the process of cleaning the membrane. And cleaning is easier if I have external falling. If I have internal falling, it can be much more difficult. Now, if you have the, the development of a falling layer, some people call it a cake layer, I actually prefer falling layer, then your equation that we have before, that was just one divided by the viscosity multiplied by the intrinsic resistance, all of these multiplied by the driving force, now it's modified because I have to add an, addis an, an additional resistance to the intrinsic resistance of the memory. And I'm here um, C from cake, but can call it falling whatever. You find 
lots of discussion in the literature about reversible and irreversible falling. I'm not going to do it because we have a limited time. I'm not going to explore that now. Now, strategies to minimize falling. If we think that falling is, uh, is really molecular interactions or interactions between solids and the surface, what you can do is you can modify the memory surface properties so you can have the memory surface, for instance, with a charge that um, gets you for interactions that are repulsive with the solid, or you change the environmental conditions of the, of the solution. For instance, playing with the pH or playing with the ionic strength. I'm not going into very much detail. If you are interested, we can discuss that. But if I play with the pH, I can play with the charge of the solid, especially if I have solids where the, the charge is not, it's not a permanent charge, it's a charge that depends on pH, okay? There is another way to deal with falling, which is called backwashing or backflushing. That can be done in place. Many times you have equipment that have what is called cleaning in place, CIP. <clears throat> but here is very funny because what we do is that we accept that falling occurs, but then we remove it and we remove it with a high frequency. So actually backwashing or backflushing is a technique that allows falling to, to start, but then we remove it very quickly. And they have a slide on that. It's something like this. So I'm plotting here the flux against time. If there is falling, I have a flux decline. So if I don't do anything, maybe the flux goes down like here without back flushing. If I do back flushing or back washing, whatever you want to call it, both words are used and sometimes a bit mixed. What I do is that I accept that falling starts occurring, but then what I do is that for a a small period of time, I, I force the permeate to, to go to the fit side. So I, I force the permeate to go in the reverse direction. And somehow I do it in a high pressure. And by doing that, it start, it removes the, um, the molecules or the particles that are causing fall. Okay. So this is usually a quick, um, you know, um, a quick input on, on the reverse um, sense. And so you see falling was accumulated. Then I do this uh, equation. I recover the flux and then I allow again falling to occur and I do the equation again, all of that. Of course, at the end of the day, you have some loss of flux, but if things are done properly, I may gain something. As there are no free lunches, there are no free I used to say that the free lunches is the one that we get at our parents. So um, uh, as there are no free lunches, to get this improvement, you pay for energy, of course. Okay? You are paying the energy cost to pump in the reverse uh, of the direction. But it can be very interesting, especially if you operate in the microfiltration or autofiltration, to have an equipment with a, with a back flush uh, um, device to, to do it. Think on something. This is particularly interesting when you are talking about filtration with porous memory. So this is particularly interesting for microfiltration and ultrafiltration. This does not make sense, of course, on reverse osmosis or nanofiltration, where you don't have pores or you have so, so, so tight pores that it doesn't make much sense to do it. But on ultrafiltration, microfiltration, this could be an interesting strategy. Now, <clears throat> We talk about falling. If we talk about polarization of concentration, I told you that polarization of concentration is basically a mass transfer phenomenon. So if it is a mass transfer phenomenon, the day will to deal with it is to better control the fluid dynamic conditions. And how can you control the fluid dynamic conditions? The basic idea is to get one of the possible approaches to get turbulence at the surface of the memory. If I have a good turbulence, then I minimize the formation of a concentration boundary layer. So how can you solve it? For instance, to operate at high cross flow velocities. But if you operate at high cross flow velocities, don't forget you have an energy penalty. You pay for that. Okay? You, you, may, you may do it, but you pay for that. So for instance, it's very rare that I use cross flow velocities below one meter per second, but you have to optimize it yourself. You have to see the trade-off between the energy expenditure and how much you gain from having a high cross velocity. The second thing that you do is to use turbulence promoters or static turbulence promoters. Turbulence promoters is because, for instance, when you have 
sorry, when you have a spiral wound or when you have a flat sheet model, the spacer that you have, the spacer is used to define the height of your channel for the fluid to circulate, but it also works as, as, a, as, a, as a turbulence promoter. Why? Because in that channel that the spacer defines, you have the, the fluid going and the fluid, uh, when it's the, um, the material of the, um, of the net that constitutes the spacer, you induce turbulence, right? So, of course, if you use spiral wounds or if you use uh, flat, um, you know, flat and frame models, you have turbulence promoters. Again, do not forget that you pay some energy penalty because if you have a turbulence promoter, you also have a higher pressure drop in the circuit, okay? Because this turbulence promoter is an obstacle, okay? Then I'm going to talk to you about um, two other techniques that might be used to control the fluid dynamics. One is called operation and uniform transmembrane pressure. This is something that the pharma industry does. And then I'm coming back to the idea of the subcritical conditions and the controlled permeate flux, okay? So let's start first with operation and uniform transmembrane pressure. Okay, I'll try to finish in 10 minutes, okay? Let's see if I can do it. Okay, if you op operate under uniform transmembrane pressure, see what happens. The conventional operation is that you have, this is your model, this is the membrane, this is the fit side. Oh, you can, cannot see my, my mouse. But look to the upper side on the right hand side. This is the conventional model. You have the field on the top and you collect the, the permeate or the filtrate on the bottom. If I represent immediately below that, that figure, um, if I represent the pressure against the axial position, you see that the retentate or the feed side, the retentate profile, there is a decrease in the pressure. But the permeate, actually the permeate here is represented as going down slightly, but basically the permeate, if it is open, this is kind of zero. Look, this is a bad way to operate. And why? Because the transmembrane pressure difference is very high at the entrance and then can become very low at the outlet. And this is wrong. Why? Because you induce a lot of fouling at the entrance of your model because you have a very large driving force, very large pressure difference. And very quickly, you end up with a high falling at the entrance. And the, the, um, the side closer with the outlet, the pressure difference is much smaller. So this is not a, a clever way to use a model. And so what was suggested actually many years ago was an operation where instead of having the, the permeate going out, you take the permeate and you circulate it on the permeate side. I'm talking about the figure on the top right hand side. So you circulate the permeate and finally you, you collect it, right? But by the fact that you circulate, you artificially create a pressure drop on the permeate side. Just look to the bottom figure on the right hand side. And so I have a profile of pressure drop on the retentate, and now I have also a profile of pressure drop on the permeate. And if I do it properly, the difference between the two is now smaller, smaller delta P. So I have, I push less material towards the surface, I have less falling, and much more control. As an engineer that likes to control the process, now I can control the pressure difference along the, uh, the model. So that's a very interesting way to, to do things. Now, the other way is operating in the subcritical conditions. And what means operating in the subcritical conditions, if you remember that figure, is I operate with a flux that is sufficiently gentle to avoid the situation when I'm pushing lots of material to the surface, and so I minimize volume. In principle, it's very difficult to totally avoid it. Okay, so nowadays we talk more about a sustainable flux than critical flux. But the general idea is that if I impose a, a certain flux, look here to the figure, I impose the flux J1, that can be very gentle. If when I impose this flux, the pressure becomes constant, is the, the part in gray, that means that there was no falling. I can start to see, okay, let's see if I do it at a higher 
at a higher flux and I go to J2. If I go to J2 and the pressure starts increasing, that means that falling starts to occur. That means that my critical flux is somewhere between J1 and J2. Now, this is a very interesting way to operate because what? Because if I operate under gentle flux, and how do I do that? I put just a pump on the permeate side and that pump tells me how much flux I allow to go. This is a very interesting way to operate instead of operating just uh, leaving the, uh, and, um, if I operate under controlled pressure, if I operate under controlled flux. Because what? I just allow a certain flux to go through and by doing that, I control how much material goes to the surface, I can minimize falling and I can operate for a long time. If I operate for a long time, I, I avoid stop operations. So for long-term operations, this is extremely interesting. And that's what people do when they operate membrane bioreactors, even industrially. This is a membrane bioreactor for wastewater treatment. There is nothing more dirt than a wastewater treatment, right? So imagine that you have your feed tank, which is really very dirt. Now imagine that you have a membrane that is submerged, so you are feeding these uh, with, a, with a feed. Your membrane is submerged and you suck the permeate from the inside and you suck with a suction pump at the flow rate that you impose and you impose a gentle one. You impose the one that gives you a sustainable flux. And if you do that, you can get the permeate that is clean. And I'm going to tell you something that probably you'll be surprised. You can operate something so dirty with a membrane bioreactor for, for instance, six months, nine months, without even cleaning it, which is amazing. But I sacrifice something. I operate at a very gentle permeate flux. That means that I, I need large membrane areas. So this was only possible when the membranes become cheaper. With the cheap cost of the membranes, I can have large areas. But the good part is that I don't have to stop every day or every week to clean, to clean the membrane. So that's a very interesting approach. And just to show you, this is exactly, this is done already industrially. It's very interesting because the traditional wastewater treatment plants, which are very complex, they can be simplified almost to one operation. You need, of course, the pretreatment. But then, instead of having all these, like this pretreatment, primary clarifier, second, activated slash, secondary clarifier, sand filter, disinfection, instead of having all this, you just have the pretreatment. Then if you want, you can put the membrane inside the activated sludge tank, as I showed you before. So this can be inside this. You, you pump from the inside and you get the clean permeate. Only that. You simplify this. And this is what you have nowadays. I have even a figure. Well, I'm not going to do publicity to Xenon, but this is just for you to see. I can have a rack of all the fibers. They are submerged. I pump the permeate from the inside with the permeate flex that I impose. That's a very interesting way to do it. And this is uh, a picture of a, um, of a wastewater treatment plant operating. You cannot see, but the memories are down here inside the reactor. Okay, I think I just uh, have two minutes and two slides. It's a bit short because I have a lot to say about these two slides. But I'm going to try to fly on. This is to say that you can operate in many different ways. The, I'll start with the one in the middle. The one in the middle is what I call a, a batch operation or a concentration node of operation. That means that you have something that you put in a tank, you feed to your, let's say, ultrafiltration device, you get the permeate, okay, and you get the retentate that you put back. That means what? That means that you are concentrating the feed, okay, because you are circulating the, the, the retentate. Your product of interest could be the, the treated permeate or your product of interest could be the concentrated molecules in the, uh, in the written date side. So it depends on what you are looking for. This is a batch operation. Then if I move to the top figure here, I have a feed tank. Instead of having a feed tank, I could just have a feed line. I don't need a feed tank, okay? But I have a feed line and I do exactly the same. With the exception that now I have a continuous feed, which means that if I have a continuous feed, what comes out has to be at the same flow rate. And what I do, I collect a permeate and I can collect, you see on the top near the retentate, I can have a reject, a reject stream here. So it means that I can do a continuous operation 
We did this, for instance, for water treatment. We could have treated water as, as the permeate, and we concentrate the reject that we remove here. For instance, if I say that I operate this with the uh, with a recovery rate of 95%, that means that the permeate represents 95% of the volume that I'm introducing, and the rejection that I have here on the top is only 5%. Okay? So, but this is a continuous operation. And finally, a dye filtration that I use a lot on the pharma industry if I want to wash out um, a contaminant from a stream. So what you do is that you put your stream of interest in the tank, you have a buffer, and you feed the buffer at a certain rate, and you remove the permeate. And what typically what you do is that you select a membrane where your contaminant goes out on the permeate, and your product of interest is retained. Imagine that you have a protein contaminated with a small molecule. That's a very nice way to do it. And I'm going to finish. Actually, I should finish now. The last slide, I'm not going to talk about it, just to say that you can have operations in one step. You can have operations in, in, in the more than one stage. And when you do operations in more than one stage, you can define different conditions in each one of the stages. This is very much done in reverse osmosis, where the pressure, the hydrostatic pressure that you use is different stage by stage. I don't have the time to explain, but that's what you do. Okay. And finally, I have, I thought, okay, probably you have lots of questions for me, but uh, if you don't have, you can use some of mine. There are lots of different things that I didn't have the time to discuss that could be interesting to discuss. Of course, after this, uh, you know, talk and um, being here together today. Of course, I'd be very much pleased if you say, okay, let's do a here a meeting just for discuss this and that. This is some of the things that I didn't have the time to to go into much detail, but uh, I'll leave that for you. And and final, of course, I I have to acknowledge our our project. It has been a pleasure to be working with all of you. I hope that we. Uh, can do very interesting work together and I finish here and I, I took a little bit more of time. Sorry for that. I talked too, too much. Thanks a lot for your attention.